Good evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to our Calypso lecture. My name is Dr. Kimon Joseph. I'm head at UWI Open Campus in Dominica, and it's my pleasure to serve as the chair this evening. So, Dr. Anthony Mighty Gabby Carter is our presenter. Also with us is Mr. Samuel Raphael, proprietor of Jungle Bay, who is a sponsor of tonight's events. We have representatives also from Domlek. We have Miss Paul, Tamara Paul from Domlek. We also have Mr. Cecil Joseph from DBS Radio and me from UWI, who are the sponsors of tonight's lecture. Also with me in the room, special people, of course, you're all special, but extremely special people in the room this evening. Father Eustace Thomas, welcome, Father. Also, Mr. Davidson Observer Victor, who is the president of the Dominica Calypso Association and the other members of the Dominica Calypso Association. We have Calypsonians in the room with us this evening, and we have Calypso lovers in the room with us this evening. Some of them are listening also and viewing live online. And we have media representatives with us too. So good evening to you all. UWI is proud to partner with the Dominica Calypso Association for this event. And so to get us started, I would like to ask Ms. Shirley, Lady S. Charles, to lead us in the national anthem. And I'd like you all to stand for the national anthem of the Commonwealth of Dominica, stanza one. Isle of beauty, Isle of splendor, Isle to all so sweet and fair. All must surely gaze in wonder at thy gifts so rich and rare. Rivers, valleys, hills, and mountains, all these gifts we do extol. Healthy land, so like all fountains, giving cheer that warms the soul. Before you sit, we have to pray. Please stand back. I now invite Father Eustace Thomas, a longtime judge of the Calypso in Dominica, to come and lead the invocation. Father Thomas. I almost thought of singing Calypso tonight, but I won't prolong the agony, so we will de declare this place divine atmosphere. Let's pray in the words Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine's kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, Lord of the dance and master of musicianship, through your omnipotence and omniscience, you have caused the UWI open campus of our nation to host this Calypso lecture in collaboration with the Dominica Calypso Association. We are here because we are invited to listen to a lecture with a difference since Dr. Anthony Mighty Gabby Carter will urge us to reflect on the role of Calypso in the Caribbean society. We thank you for the response to our invitation from this 10-time monarch who has been involved in bringing joy and laughter to his people while being the conscience of his nation without desecrating it. As we are about to listen to this Caribbean intellectual luminary, musician and social commentator, we ask you to protect and anoint him, that by enlightening him, 
we, his audience, will be so well conscientized that we, in turn, will emulate him by illuminating the people we meet in our daily lives. Teach us to deepen our love and respect for the art form and cherish Dominica as a good doctor appreciates Barbados and people throughout the Caribbean. Bless the organizers of this lecture. Cleanse those who are listening to us through various means of social communications and grant us your healing mercies. Amen. I would like us to, to stretch our hands towards uh, the doctor and pray for divine intervention. Anointing fall on him, anointing let it fall on him. All of the Holy Ghost let it fall on him, anointing fall on him. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Father. Father Eustace Thomas, priest at the Lady of Fairhaven Cathedral. Our national anthem was done by Miss Shirley Lady S. Charles, who is the vice president of the Dominica Calypso Association, the first female vice president. So thank you both very much. In addition to my responsibilities as chair, I am also asked to give the opening remarks on behalf of the University of the West Indies Open Campus, and so I shall do so at this time. UWI is proud. Oh, Gabby, you can sit now. <laughs> Poor thing. All right. UWI is proud to partner with the Calypso Association for the celebration of Calypso Week 2023. We have assisted with two events so far. Firstly, we helped to organize the celebration of Mass at St. Patrick's Church in Grand Bay on Sunday the 2nd of July, 2023. This celebration was a memorable one. Father Branca John, a Calypso King himself, was a celebrant, and we had an amazing time. We offer our sincerest thanks to the people of Grand Bay for the warm welcome along with the delicious brunch after mass. That was a wonderful surprise. So thank you very much to the people of Grand Bay. Tonight, we are honored to host this public lecture with the Dominica Calypso Association. We are particularly honored that Dr. Anthony Mighty Gabi Carter agreed to present for us. This is a real treat indeed. Tonight, Mighty Gabi will be presenting on the topic, the role of Calypso in Caribbean society. Tonight's lecture will explore the historical and contemporary role that Calypso has played in West Indian civilization. There is no doubt that Calypso is one of the most politically charged musical traditions in the world and its deep roots in the struggle of Caribbean people have built a legacy of wit and imaginative lyrics that deal with a variety of topics and themes of West Indian life. Dr. Hollis, Hollis Chokdas Liverpool, the legendary Trinidadian Calypsonian, once described Calypso's purpose as one that, quote, served to bring light where darkness surrounded people, and to be a beacon of wisdom wherever and whenever ignorance tended to reign, unquote. He goes on to say that, although some may see Calypsonians as mere musicians and entertainers, others see them as, quote, sociologists, psychologists, philosophers, thinkers, leaders, and historians in their own right, unquote. And so, we are here tonight to first listen to our presenter, and then we'll be able to participate in what I hope will be a meaningful discussion afterwards. Gabi, we are very happy to have you with us tonight. We know you skipped a lot of things to be here with us in Dominica. I thank you, and I thank everybody who's here and everyone who's listening to my voice, and we look forward to a wonderful evening. Thank you very much.
So this evening, UWI is collaborating with the Dominica Calypso Association. And so, to give the collaborative remarks, I invite Mr. Denison Observer Victor, who is the president. Oh, De not Denison, he's Davidson. Denison is somebody else. Sorry, King Dice. <laughs> I invite Mr. Davidson Observer Victor, who is the president of the Dominica Calypso Association, to give remarks on behalf of the association. Mr. Victor. Okay, good evening again. I just want to, uh, on behalf of the Calypso Association and the executive, to welcome Dr. Gabi in, to our presence, you know. Yeah, welcome, welcome. You know, while I'm sitting there, you know, things happening, and it's, sometimes it ends up like you're wondering if it's a coincidence or if it is divine intervention. Because during the carnival season, when we were doing the judging, deep in for the Calypsonians I was supposed to give her a thing and say well um, who was eluding the Denison dies Joseph from being the Calypsonian who won the most strong and I say well he and Chuck just tied and, 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 and look out for him to try to win the crown this year but somebody point out no Mr. Gabby is the one that is eluding dice because he have more crown than dice and coincidentally, when I was supposed to be called by name to come here and say what I supposed to say, I was called Denison. <laughs> is that coincidence or is it divine intervention? No, not too long. I not too long. I didn't want. I, I, I touch on that topic in the opening and the launching of the Calypso week. So I didn't plan to touch on it here. But again, too, I wonder if it's coincidence or if it's divine intervention. When Father was about to give his, his um, views, he ended up saying that he wanted to sing Calypso, but he don't have the time so he can't sing Calypso. But on Sunday, we had a mass with Bronca John, Reverend Bronca John, celebrating 10 years as a priest, as an ordained priest. He came from Calypso and went into priesthood. And then in recent time, I see, well, I was I, I searching for a little more understanding of blackness and those things. So I start to look up um, and listen to speeches of the great freedom fighters. And Louis Farrakhan is one of the persons that I look very closely. And then in one of his speeches, I end up catching that he say that many years ago he started to sing Calypso. He was actually singing Calypso in one of his speeches. And I say, well, wow. So I sit in here and I say to myself, but wait a while, but what is really, is there, is, is, is there something special about Calypso so much that religious people usually takes our Calypsonian. So Kelly the ghost always used to tell us on the executive when things are going wrong, don't read that man. God loves Calypso. He'll always make something happen good for Calypso. So I suspect because of that, God loves Calypso. So he taking his Calypsonians and he elevating them to higher heights. And that's why today we are here. We want to use the opportunity to elevate Calypso. So we're saying Calypso Day is three years now. We have another Calypso Day. And uh, we decide this year, okay, uh, an idea come up to make it bigger and better. So it is called Calypso Week, Calypso Day, slash, almost like a confusion. But next year, it will be straight Calypso Week because we have started a movement and we realize the movement is growing and it has potential and we're going to go for it. But people may say, but what, what, what effort? Why are these guys putting so much effort into Calypso? Does Calypso really deserve it? I will not go into that because that is what the doctor is here to let us understand. The reason why we feel that Calypso is so significant that we have to spend all our energy trying to sustain it and maintain it. He will tell us about it. But 
The responsibility of the Dominican Calypso Association is to sustain the Calypso art form, but we cannot do it alone. And that's why we are here tonight. We could have been somewhere else, but we are here because we are here with the collaboration of a few persons and a few institutions. And the first one I want to mention is the University of the West Indies. When we brought the idea to collaborate with them, they instantly buy into the idea and they just run with it, you know? And the rest is basically what is happening tonight. So that is what collaboration really does. Um, DBS Radio, Cecil Joseph as the manager, always willing to partner with us. And then we decide to bring in new persons, go out of our normal sponsors and search for new persons. And one of the first persons that came to mind when Gabby was come, when the doctor was coming along is to try to get one of the best resort, if not the best resort in the Caribbean or probably possibly on the planet, which is the Jungle Bay. So we, we had him as first choice, and the moment we called Jungle Bay, it was an instant um, collaboration and an instant, and, it, 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 and, and the partnership was so good that the manager, the managing director and owner of Jungle Bay decide, you know something, Fred O's or Kelly Douglas William is not going to, to transport Gabby. I, as the managing director, is going to transport my guest to the lecture. Put your hands together. That's what collaboration does. And then we have the alias forces and, well, the mighty Gabby. Mighty Gabby would not be there. Would not, would not be here if his management did not buy into the idea as well because they have their tent opening and where you see him there probably Calypso tent on his mind you know, because their tent opening as the manager told us sometime this week so Calypso probably well on his mind in Barbados but he's here because of the, the importance that the management saw in him and basically we just felt that Calypso Association has reached a stage where we think that Calypso has grown so much that it is important now for us to try to bring other persons along with us. So we are really the custodians of Calypso, but we don't have all the ideas. You understand? And there is a saying before that always, oh, Calypso Association doesn't listen to people. The man doesn't take ideas from nobody, but that is not so. We're always ready to listen to people. We're always ready to collaborate. And we are happy that the collaboration is bearing fruits. And we look forward to doing better and greater collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Victor. I was asked to especially accommodate a young lady who did her SBA on Calypso and did extremely well. And so I now invite Ms. Jacinta Grant at the request of the Dominica Calypso Association to give a few remarks before we move in tonight's featured presentation. Jacinta. A pleasant good evening to Dr. Kimon Joseph, the head of the University of the West Indies Open Campus, Dominica, and other members of the staff of the UWI Open Campus. Dr. Anthony Mighty Gabby Carter, the lecturer presenter of tonight. Mr. Sam Raphael, the proprietor of Jungle Bay Resort and a sponsor of tonight's lecture. Mr. Davidson Observer Victor, the president of the Dominica Calypso Association, and other members of the executive of the Dominica Calypso Association. Calypsonians, Calypso lovers in the UWI auditorium, and those listening and viewing live, and media representatives. Two years ago, in my fourth year of high school, we, myself and my classmates, were met with the task of finding out how Calypso had chronicled significant social and political issues in Dominica from 1960 to 1985, the topic chosen for our history SBA. My first thought was quite what one would expect it to be. Oh, that's a good topic. Should be easy to write and research about, right? Wrong. For the next year or so, my SBA partner, Jada Francis, and I spent hours browsing the seemingly bleak internet, searching tirelessly for documents, sites, books, any piece of information that would prove useful in this endeavor. 
We visited the National Archives numerous times and flipped through all Calypso magazines, taking pictures of Calypsonian names in hopes that we would find their songs somewhere online. It was there that we stumbled upon Steinberg Henry's Calypso Drift, a truly interesting read for Calypso and culture lovers, one which I implore you indulge in. However, at some point while completing the research for this assessment, I realized that we did not quite understand our topic. And in utter confusion, I asked myself, how had Calypso been used to chronicle significant social and political issues in Dominica? And what significant social and political issues were there between 1960 and 1985? It then occurred to me that for about 17 years of living on this island, my knowledge on its history was next to nothing. An appalling thought for someone who prior to this epiphany had assumed that they were well educated. But I realized that I was not the only one suffering from this ignorant bliss. I can assure you that if you were to walk up to the average Dominican youth within teenage and young adult age and ask them who Seraphine Hyacinth, the mighty Con Lambi was, and how she contributed to the Calypso art form, you would be met with perplexed faces and a resounding who? Or maybe ask them about the Black Power Movement in Dominica, the Dread Act of 1974, or the attempted coup d'etat on Dame Mary Junior Charles. Once more, crickets and echoing silence. It astounds me how much of Dominican history is forgotten, like all books on a shelf gathering dust while being nibbled on by cockroaches or succumbing to mold. It astounds me how little is documented about Dominican history. The mere fact that I could stand here today and tell you all about Castro and Eric Gary, but not much on O.J. Seraphine as ascertains this. However, what astounds me the most would be how much of our history is preserved through Calypso. From spiders singing Sankey and Shiloh to Lord Breaker's income tax rebel, Calypsonians have played an instrumental role in chronicling and, dare I say, shaping Dominican history. Through their skillfully composed music filled with innuendos, puns, and double entendre, a display of local prowess meant to entertain and inform, Calypsonians have brought forward the cries of the people. In fact, Calypso, in and of itself, is of the people, by the people, and for the people. It saddens me to say that this purpose has been lost to the youth, often disregarded by those who fail to understand the political, social, and historical significance of the genre. Today, as we celebrate Calypso Day, we celebrate the work of the pioneers of this art form, as well as those who have kept it alive and are keeping it, keeping it alive to this date. To lose Calypso is to lose our culture, the legacy of our forefathers, what makes us truly Dominican. And if we forget or disregard the power of Calypso, we are forgetting and disregarding the power of our voices and the power of the people. Daryl the Bob Bob said it best when he stated, Calypso is really a culture of defiance against a system that is not treating the people as it should. Calypso is a cry of the people. Thank you. Jacintha, thank you. Thank you, Jacintha. And in a world where most young people are not getting the praise that they deserve, I want to personally tell you how proud I am of you. I train people in public speaking, and I must say you should come and help me to teach my class. You did extremely well. I vaguely remember the topics I chose for the four SBAs I had to write at convent, but I do not think I had half that kind of passion for a topic. I am just very proud of you, and I can see why you would have done so excellently and why the Calypso Association would have asked you to present today. So thank you very much. But Davidson is disturbing me, and I don't know why. I'm disturbing you in a good way. That is the best disturb you could ever get. I'm not even running this by the executive. I am vetoing it. I am actually making you an honorary member of the Dominica Calypso Association. You will, you, will, you will participate in every activity the Calypso Association has. You'll be given an ID to attend every single Calypso show free of charge. Thank you very much for your show of support, and I think you deserve it indeed, young lady. 
So, we are getting ready to um, have our presenter. And so, to introduce our speaker for this evening, Mr. Narin Trendsetter Mosley, who is the treasurer of the Dominica Calypso Association, will come forward. Narin? All you know this one, this is our version. I present tonight oh. performing. Give me some volume and bubble. Wow! Hey, baby girl, when you whine, when you push back. Hey, baby girl, when you whine, when you push back. Hey, baby girl, when you whine, when you push back. Hey, baby girl, when you whine. I was feeling it. Yeah, she got my mid in to call the junction. Hey, baby girl, when you whine, when you push back. Hey, baby girl, when you whine. Can you give me step? Why you be a duke? Did you forget about your man? Hey, baby girl, when you whine, when you push back. Hey, baby girl, when you whine. Give me one in section, in genius section. I did not have to pay. She give me something and tell me, hello. Took me down right now. But in section, in genius section, I did Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. That is a song of 20 years ago. And a few, maybe last year or so, it was remixed. So when you create good music, it has no expiration date. So, yeah, man. So let me recognize the presence of some wonderful persons among our mates. We have Dr. Kimon Joseph the head of the Open Campus Dominica and other members of the UWI Campus, Dr. Anthony Mighty Gabi Carter, our lecturer and presenter tonight, Mr. Sam Raphael, proprietor of Jungle Bay Resort and a sponsor for tonight's lecture, Mr. Davidson, Observer Victor, and the other members of the Calypso Association, Calypsonians, Lovers in this Calypso lovers in this UV auditorium and those listening live via DBS social media platform also recognize Monsignor Eustace Thomas. I've been given a, a mighty task to present a legend and I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Dr. Anthony Mighty Gabi Carter is a Calypsonian an actor from Barbados. He won his first crown in 1968 with a song entitled Heart Transplant. That's correct, Gabby? <laughs> he won the title again in the following year, 1969, from Heart Transplant to Family Planning. <laughs> and then again in 1985, so he would have had three crowns thus far. Mighty Gabby would go on to win the Calypso Monarch title on former occasions, 97, 99, 2000 together with Hunter, and 2020 as well, a total of seven Calypso Monarchs. He would have also won Crop Over and other road match titles. Over the years, Mighty Gabby has been a household name with infectious hits such as Jack, and lift right, lift right, the government boots, the government boots. What about I was feeling ill when I get a house call from Dr. Cassandra? He also had hit it, a cricket match with a lady, and so much more songs that we all enjoyed. In 2004, he was named cultural ambassador of Barbados. In 2007, Gabi was named a Nigerian chief in a service of the Sons of God Apolistic Spiritual Baptist Church. When he visited Ni Nigeria, Gabi was given the name, and I want to be right, Omowali, which means our son has returned. And tonight our son has returned to Dominica. In 2012, he was awarded an honorary Doctor of Letters degree by the University of the West Indies. Gabi is regarded as the foremost folk singer in Barbados. Tonight, the title of his presentation for this Calypso lecture is The Role of Calypso in Caribbean Society. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, let us welcome in a big Dominican way, Dr. Anthony Mighty Gabby Carter. Thank you very much. I just want to say that I am so lucky that I was brought here this evening by my good new friend, Sam Raphael. But I believe he'd be my friend longer than either one of us know because we are both friends of my dear friend, Tony Astafan. And uh, Many, many years ago, here in Dominica, I had a dear friend, very close, like a brother. And I get emotional when I think about him because I believe that he was one of the greatest leaders. The greatest leaders the Caribbean has ever produced. His name was Rosie Douglas. My dear friend. This evening I want to thank the Calypso Association, especially Bob and the others, Dr. Joseph. We were liaising with each other for quite some time. And I want you to know that last night I was supposed to be in a country called Trinidad and Tobago because the CARICOM Prime Ministers, including our own Prime Minister, Mayor Motley, asked me to come to CARICOM to sing at the opening ceremony of the 50th anniversary of CARICOM. And with a heavy heart, I told them that I was committed to Dominica and I couldn't come because Dominica called months ago and they only called one week ago when I was in Venezuela. I went to Venezuela to celebrate Caribbean week. A lot of us don't know this, but Dominica would know it tonight. Venezuela has a very strong Calypso um, lineage. In fact, an entire state is called the Calypso State in Venezuela. And believe me, they can sing Calypso. It may be in Spanish, but it is Calypso. So we went there to celebrate with them. Tonight, I want to go back a little bit For many, many years, we were lied to about who we are and where we come from and where our history started. And they always start at the point of slavery. Absolute madness. First of all, we have to remember that mankind itself live by seven liberal arts. They are mathematics, science, biology, linguistics, music, architecture, and astrology. And who gave us those? Egypt. At that time, it was called Kemet, K-E-M-E-T. And the Egyptians were so brilliant that they, like I said, music. They produced some of the finest musicians. And in fact, the first musicians. And they were very adventurous as well. So they sailed. And they sailed 
from Northern Africa, and I want to make the point about Egypt, because Europeans for years will say to us, Egypt and Africa, as though they were two different places. But Egypt is just another North African country like Libya and the rest of them. And they sailed into West Africa, places like Mali, what we call Nigeria today, Ghana, and so on, and took their music with them. A lot of the times, the music was played to one rhythm, and if you went from one side of Africa to the next, you would hear a six, eight rhythm. Bada, ba, ba, doom, bam, bam, 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 all over Africa. But when our people were enslaved, they had to make the trip across the Ethiopian Sea, which we call today the Atlantic Ocean. The original name is the Ethiopian Sea. But you see, Ethiopia was so big and powerful that they didn't want the sea to remain the Ethiopian Sea. So they said, let's call it the Atlantic Ocean. So Europeans renamed the Ethiopian Sea the Atlantic Ocean. So there we were, sailing in those nice, beautiful uh, tourist liners. And if you think so, I have some nice arbor land to sell you in the Sahara Desert. In those horrible slave ships. And they had the temerity to call one of those ships the Jesus. The Jesus. It was one of the more well-fitted ships that the British had. You do your research and you're going to find that it is absolutely true. And we came over as smart people with music in our bones, in our psyche, in our minds, in our souls, in our hearts. And we brought that music with us and a lot of other things. For example, when our people wanted to escape, they had maps. Maps that the Europeans could not define, could not understand. You see those braids that we get with our little children today, and we braid the style. That was the map. Someone would escape the plantation, and they would return and plait another person's hair who would plait another person's hair and show them how to escape by the design in the hair. And not only that, they would sow seeds in their hair as well because they didn't know where they were going and if they would starve or not, but they knew that certain foods would keep them alive. So they would put the seeds in their hair. But they brought the music. The drum was the most important instrument in the music. But you know, our people have always been looking for position. And so, it is said that it happened in Barbados. No doubt that one individual slave, and I said, let me start by saying, first of all, that no slaves came to the Caribbean, not even one. What happened, and I was trying to tell my friend Sam Raphael today, he said, Gabby, don't tell me, tell me at the lecture. What happened was our people used to communicate by drum. 
send messages by Trump. I witnessed it in Nigeria when he became a chief because there were two young men beating the drums and there was a person interpreting, telling me exactly the, what they were saying or they were welcoming me into Nigeria, into Elara and making me a chief after three days of ceremony. Okay. <clears throat> so we used to communicate by the drum. So one, on one plantation, this guy was playing the drum and this looking for position fellow said, ah, Masa, you know what he is doing? He said, no. Of course not. What is he doing? He's sending a message to his sister on the plantation in St. Lucie to ask her if the baby born. It's impossible. That can't happen. Master, I am telling you the truth. You see what he do there? Ah, he is saying to his sister, is the baby born yet? How is he doing that? The drum, you see when he play like that? That is not just play, you know. He is sending message to his sister. Well, he said, well, you go, you could do the job. Yes, master, I can. Send a message and see if it would come back. He plays the drum. What he said? He said, yes, the baby born and everything is okay. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Drum ban from that day on. Not only here, but especially in the United States. And in, in particular, Virginia and North and South Carolina. Why those three? Because the British had settled those three from Spitestown in Barbados, which was the capital city at the time, not Bridgetown. And it might be interesting to learn that the first seven governors of Virginia were either Barbadians or of Barbadian parentage. That's how much influence we had and still have in the United States, but they never recognize it. But back to the drum. So they banned the drum throughout the entire length and breadth of slavery. And we were allowed to play other instruments. So at the end of the crop over, crop over meaning the end of the sugar cane crop, they knew that they had some fine musicians in and amongst those who were enslaved. And they would ask them to play, minus the drum, which they know was the belly of our music. It still is the belly, every single calypso. You can't play it and get the feeling without the drums. It's impossible. And so for years, at the end of the crop, they would play. And you might hear songs like Steal Away Home. Steal away home, steal away home. And then they change the words and say, steal away home to Jesus. That's not what the slaves were singing. They were singing, steal away home, steal away home. Steal away home to Africa because they want to escape. Who wants to be on a plantation 18 and 20 hours a day working for free? Nobody. And so after the so-called emancipation, they allowed the drum to re-emerge and they re-emerge with power. Power. And that was the nucleus, that was the embryo of what we know as Calypso today. Because it came back with a force that was unstoppable till today. And those Early Calvisonians, as I called them, the singers, would make what they call call and respond. So they might go 
Where are you today? And somebody say, Dominica. Let me hear you. Where are you today? Where are you today? Let me hear you say. That's how Africans do their music. They call and they respond. And that's how we got to structure our calypsos. And till today, we do it in a lot of the songs. In a lot of them. You know, that body, that Africanness that they try to make us deny ourselves of can never leave us because it is who we are. It is who we are. But the British came with their game and it was a brilliant game and tried to tell the Africans on the continent that we don't like them and tell us, you see them Africans, they got nothing to tell, them nothing to do with you, you know. But when I got to Africa, I found the opposite to be true. They embraced us. They wanted to know about us. Some of them had never heard about Dominica or Barbados or Grenada. I thought they heard of Jamaica because of the music and because of the athletes. But had never heard about us. And they were so enthralled. They wanted to be part of us. And when we began to play the music, they danced and they, they, they were so happy to think. And they say, ah, you don't only look like us. You actually play music like us. Ah, we are so happy. Right? Because it made them happy. And so, if you go back, you're going to find in the early days, right here in Dominica, right in those French islands like St. Lucia, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Grenada, Trinidad itself, right? That movement of the music and musicians. Don't let nobody fool you. They had Dominican Calypsonians in Trinidad for a long, long time. From St. Lucia too. Because we were never a people to stay stagnant. So when they come with the story that Columbus, that little lion boy, uh, <laughs> said he discovered Dominica, he discovered West Indies in 1492, not true. The Africans were trading with who we call Indians for thousands of years. They are accustomed to come. As a matter of fact, when he made that trip, he went to Sierra Leone and collected three navigators. One for the Nina, one for the Pinta, and one for the Santa Maria. And the one who was on his boat is who got down here first and showed them how to get here. This nonsense about how he was sailing and he thought he was going to India. And, uh, nonsense. Those Africans knew how to get down here. They were tired coming. They didn't know how to come. Not just here. How to get to Mexico. All of those big pyramids that you see in South America look exactly like the ones in Africa. It cannot be coincidental. And not only that, they found spears, golden tip spears in Mexico that were identical to spears found in West Africa. I know what the Europeans said. Oh, let me tell you what happened. The tide, you know, bring across the arrows. The tide. It wasn't no tide. It was trading long before that little lion boy Columbus came on the scene. And so we got to understand how our music came about. It came about because we are indeed African people born in the Caribbean. 
and we walked with the spirit and we walked with the drum and we walked with this, the continuity of who we are. We are special people. When we had universities, those people, those Europeans were still living in mountains and caves and trees. And we had universities. And they would like to tell you that they educated us. Please, we educated them. If you check the history of the Moors, we educated them. We taught them how to bathe. They had no idea about bathing. We showed them what was a bath, how to build it. Even with the Roman Catholic uh, popes, we had some great black popes, but you don't hear about them. Great! Because they were so highly educated and so brilliant in leadership that they were able to become popes. So you got to understand the whole picture that I'm painting to show you how the Calypso is so important to Caribbean society. And then, skip a few years, the emancipation come, we got back our drum, we are able to play. Don't let nobody fool you that Calypso just started in Trinidad and Tobago. It was in all of these islands. And even in the 1920s and 30s and so on, when Trinidad emerged as the capital of Calypso, they had musicians from Dominica there, Guyana, St. Vincent, Grenada, Barbados. As a matter of fact, I'll give you another piece of history. When the British took over Trinidad from the French, the Trinidadians were speaking two languages, Spanish and French. And it was the Barbadians that went in and taught the Trinidadians English. This is very true. And so the movement came not just teaching of English, but music, exchanging of ideas, people sailing on the schooners to Trinidad and back and forth. As a matter of fact, for six years, just as you have Trinidad and Tobago, it was Barbados and Tobago. It was that close. And the musicians were going back and forth on the little schooners and so on. And that music started to rise. It started to come. And give Trinidad the credit. They hold on to it stronger than any of us. And so our people were going there to sing, to play, to dance, to participate in the carnival. And from early, very early, the Calypsonians were like the town criers. They were saying to the people what was happening in the society. Bringing the story, the many stories, and it affected the politics of the day till today. There are Calypsonians that put parties in power and put them out in all the Caribbean islands because of the structure of their songs and of the way how it was done. When I was a little boy, our Prime Minister, Mayor Motley's grandfather, was the mayor of Bridgetown. Barbados has no mayor today. That was because he and his good friend Earl Barra get in a squabble and Earl Barra decided to have no more city council, which took away Motley's power. His name was Ernest Dighton Motley, but his friends would call him rugged because he was rugged. And um, I was but 10 years old. And he kept a meeting. 
and Motley would always allow the speakers to speak and so on, his guest speakers. While they're speaking, he's in the rum shop, buying drinks, dancing, thinking with the women and this and that, that this, the, the meeting going on, you know. And then he would come out and they would, they would call him Papa Mots. Papa Mots coming. And he and a man called Sidney Papa Lightfoot would come out together 90% of the time. Just Papa Lightfoot and Motley. I was a little boy. And I remember a Motley speech that was brilliant. That lasted about 10 seconds. Motley said, you all think that we should vote for Emmy Cox, the man called Mencia Cox. And no, but I can tell you why you are right. Cox has the biggest breadfruit tree in the whole of Barbados. He is my friend, and I just get some of the breadfruits. I have to tell the truth. But he has a maid. And do you know what Cox does? He just conk the breadfruits before he leaves home on mornings. And he just put his hand in the butter. So that if the maid tried to cook a breadfruit and use some of the butter, he would know and she would get fired. You think that is somebody to vote for? And you know, no, Mr. Motley, no, Lord, no, no, no. But like that then, and out through the door, no issues, no nothing about the economy, no no nothing. They couldn't beat him. That's what they want to hear. They, they want nothing to do with who can fix the gutter and the road and the light and work. And, uh, talking about cops. And he made sure he tells you straight that Cox is his friend. But do not vote for him because look what he do with the poor maid. And giving me that don't need the breadfruit, any amount of breadfruits I want. And that poor maid that got them three children that hungry, he would not let her get one at all. So I wrote a song, my first ever song. And it was entitled, Vote for Motley and Get Free Cakey. Because as mayor, he used to give the poor people keiki or khaki, as you call it, right? You would get a little medicine and about two, three shillings. My mother used to get about five shillings because, not because we had five children, but because she was Motley's friend. And an unfair thing used to occur too because she would leave home like nine o'clock to go and the line is from here to Afghanistan outside the office. And Motley Lion would say, Oh Lord Rose, I tell you, you come here ready this morning and I tell you, do not go back in that line. Come back here. What are you doing in the back? That time my mother now got there, you know. But they're friends. And she would go up and get five shillings and the average person would get two. Right? Because she was also the woman who would go with his friend Dick Seeley and do um, Dick Seeley used to be an undertaker. They got a fancy name for it now. We call it funeral director. You know? And Barbadians don't have grave diggers anymore. We have soil technicians. That is not a lie. We do not have any grave diggers in Barbados anymore. What our people are called what? Soil technicians. That's right. That's a natural, true term in Barbados for a grave digger. But anyway, so I wrote this song. This song is the worst song that anybody ever wrote in their life. And it became Motley's campaign song for the city. And it goes like, vote for Motley and get free cakey. Vote for Motley and get free cakey. Don't mind nobody. Don't mind nobody. Vote for Motley and do what? And get free cakey. That's all the songs are saying. Not another word, not another line, not a, I ain't know nothing about no writing, no song at 10 years old. But all the little children in the village start singing this thing. And then the big people picked it up. And it became Motley's campaign song. Unfortunately, in those days, we didn't have no money to do no recording or no nothing like that. 
but it was the first song to encourage me to become a Calypsonian. And, you know, I started to rise from there, but I pay homage to Attila the Hun, the lion, the growling tiger, Spitfire, the roaring lion. The roaring lion became my friend. He wrote brilliant songs. He wrote songs that you don't know he wrote. You ever heard a Christmas song called, He come from the glory, He come from the glorious kingdom. That's lion song. And they tried to steal it from him for decades. And Eddie Grant stepped in on Lion's behalf and Lion got back the rights to his song. They claimed that they thought he was dead 50 years. So they kept his money and Lion got it back late in his life, in his 90s. Right? Kitchener became my friend. Simple. I was, the Sparrow was my friend since 1968. But I had never made friends with Kitchener. Only just admiring how great a Calypsonian he was. I was at Madison Square Garden a Sunday at the Mother's Day show. I was bent in pain. I passed by his room. I didn't even know that was his room. And he Gabby, come on, come, come on. Because Kitchener stammers very badly and sang, and sang perfectly. So I said, yeah, I said, say, yeah, Kitchi. He said, why, why are you doing like that, man? I said, well, ear, the ear. He said, garlic and ginger. I said, how you mean garlic and ginger? B -b 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 Boil the two together, garlic and ginger. <laughs> Air come from parts of your body you never know exist. I said, what? Well, I went home and tried the thing. And after two days, till this day, I never had a problem with that. Because I used to eat badly. Not bad food. Just either eight today, ten tomorrow, twelve the next day, this and that. And your body do not like that. The body get vexed when you do stupidness like that. You have to have a pattern of eating and that saved me. And Kitch and I became very close friends. And even like when I went to Trinidad, my first time singing in tents and all that, there was a choice between Sparrow's tent and Kitchener's tent. I didn't know which one to choose. I just love these two men so much. Which one you're going to choose? So I went to Eddie Grant. I said, Eddie, I'm getting calls from Kitch. I'm getting calls from Sparrow. Which one to go? He looked, he paused a long time. He said, go with Sparrow. I said, why? Kitchener would not be vexed with you. Sparrow is your close friend. <laughs> and you're going to be vexed if you go with Kitchener. So I said, so that they went down. And the very first night I was in Trinidad, I got boots left, right, the government. <laughs> and um, Kitchener... I went to see him. He was in his dressing room. I said, Kitch, I'm really sorry. He said, no, 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 no. If the management said, good man, good, good, Gabby, I just got to see you, man. I said, all right. I felt good. I went down with Sparrow. And I lived at Sparrow's house for months. Months. And we don't call him Sparrow or Birdie. Or we call him Spee. And that's it. Spee. Well, how this and that and that. He said, well, Gabby, the faster they rhyme, the better. The faster they rhyme. I couldn't conceptualize what he was saying. He said, he said if you said, the cat sat on the mat, that's rhyme. But if you said, that fat cat, that sat on the mat was a rat. He said, they go pay attention. They must pay attention because it's the idea you're a madman, you're talking stupidness, or you're a genius. So, you know, little hints like that I got from Sparrow, right? And so, 
our friendship remained. When Kitch died, we went to the funeral. He was, he was such a wonderful human being. It's almost unbelievable. A lion. Lion was a little thirsty, but Lion was a generous man. He was hurt because he felt that Trinidad did not treat him the way they should have. Because they had promised him that they're going to buy the archives. Because Lion had everything in pristine condition from 1928, you know. When we got there, Lion got recordings that were not 45s, but 78s. That he had in a trunk, not in a valise. In an old time trunk with some, uh, what do you call it? Velvet kind of thing down in there. I don't know what you call that. Recordings that he did in the United States in 1928. Eddie Grant has every one of them today. Right? And when we got there, some of the Trinidadians were not too pleased. They said, We're thief in the culture. But what they did not know is that we salvage a lot of that, that music from people pick pen and, and things like that. They kept the, 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 um, the originals in pig and shoy and chicken pens. We found some on the Dr. Martin Sampat's examination uh, bed. He had a bed in his office that you would go in and you lay down and he would examine you and so on. Underneath that bed were some of Sparrow's originals. And he was happy when Ed Grant, oh God, yes, 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 please take it, take it, take it. I don't know what to do with it. I don't know what to do with it. Right? And I told Eddie, I said, Eddie, those tapes cannot play. You just waste a lot of time and money. He said, Garbage, you think after we chase these tapes for seven years that God will be so bad to us that these tapes ain't going to play? And Frank Agarat, who was my engineer and Eddie's, took them home and like how you just wash clothes, Frank washed off all the chicken poo and this and that and that and that and put the tapes to hang out like how you hang out clothes for three days on the roof of his house. And Eddie Grant took them to Barbados. And he called me in the studio and he put it on and it sounded like it was made yesterday. Clean. Everything. Because the man who recorded those, God rest him in his grave. He was a brilliant engineer. He was a former BB pilot as well. In the 30s and the 40s. And he took care. The ones that he had. No pigeon coop, no chicken, nothing in pristine condition. And he said he'd never taped over one single recording because tape meant to record on. Mr. Christopher and South Sparrow's early recordings were done by Mr. Christopher and he called it Christophonic Song. You could look and back and see it. And I felt so privileged to be in his presence because here's this man, 90 something years old, a little half deaf at the time. And by the way, you hear people talk about if it was Sparrow or if it was Lord Blakey that sat, uh, made Jean and Dinah. It was Mr. Christopher. And he made us promise not to talk about it until he died. He said, don't, don't, please don't say it. I don't want to hurt either artist. But he wrote that song. This calypso that we take for granted has documented the history of the Caribbean time and time again. Better than any journalist, no disrespect to my journalist friends here this evening. Because it takes a journalist a time, I used to be a journalist, to write that article. And you know what happens? It makes either front page, headline, or both. Today, by this evening or tomorrow morning, 
Miss Mary is wrapping fish with it in the market. It's not that valuable unless you are a history buff and you are researching and you want to get back to it. And so all journalists know this. But when you write a song and it's recorded, it's almost as perennial as the grass. It's almost as perennial as the grass. And so we have to value our Calypsonians and the work that they have done in every Caribbean country because they keep the politicians on their toes. Sometimes they, uh, they make alliances to particular parties. Sometimes they're in opposition to an, uh, some particular party. But the thing is, they write the history of the Calypso. You had songs like, not a damn seat for them, Lord Kitchener. You had songs by Calypsonians talking about the Germans and how they're going to mash up the Germans and how this and that. It's still there. They knew the history. A lot of them are highly intelligent. And some of them are so sharp that it would amaze you. Now take, for example, my friend Dennis Williams, whom you know as Merchant. Merchant was so brilliant that he did not know one single note of what he was playing. He was composer, good guitar player, and singer. And when he was sick, I went on it to look for him. I said, Dennis, there's a rumor going around that you do not know what card you're holding, if it's CFG, whatever. Um, could that be possible? He said, Gabby, it is absolutely true. I do not know what I'm playing. I just, just get the feeling and I write. I said, Dennis, I would just remind you in case you forget yourself that you have written more than 700 songs. And you are saying that none of them cards you play to make the song you don't know. He said, no. I said, would you like to learn? I, he said, sure, man. I took up my guitar. I said, you see that? That is C. You see that? That is F. You see that? That is G. You got it? C, F, G. He said, oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, CFG. I'm leaving the hospital half hour later. And Dennis calls me back. Hey, Gabi, what's that thing you showed me again, boy? <laughs> Can't remember. And it never stopped him from making brilliant music. Some of us know how to play instruments and so on. And he played the instrument too. And we could call every chord. We know with CFG, this, that, minor, this, and that, and that. He didn't. Spoiler. Sparrow told me if there's one man he has to pay homage to, is Spoiler. Spoiler sang some amazing songs. Spoiler sang a song called Woman Police. Now it's all right for us today to talk about a woman police. The truth is, at that time, no part of the Caribbean had a woman police. All the police were men. And here's spoiler. Woman policeman hold me tight. Woman policeman hold me tight. I gonna behave bad there for spite for she to hold me tight, tight, tight. You understand? Because he was saying like, they got to be women police. They had no women police at that time. He talked about twin brother in one of his songs. He said that his brother was a very good footballer. But he didn't like playing sports at all. But he used to always go and see his brother play. And he was sitting in the stand and he felt this big kick and a cuff because the man said that he was out there playing a lot of foolishness. So his twin brother is who doing this thing, but he's getting the punishment in the stand because as far as the man concerned, it's the same person. So why are you doing there? You could be here, there, anywhere, right? That's the kind of creativity that Spoiler had. He talked about the, the, the woman that had the bath that she used to, 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 to keep young by bathing, and then one day she couldn't get to bed, and she, she, she turned into a skeleton, you know? He was that brilliant, a writer. 
he, he sang a song called Talking Backwards. Suppose every woman could afford to sit down and learn how to talk backward. And everything he said was talking backwards. But you know what was the most, most amazing about this man? He could not read and write as we know it. His mother, I met his mother when she was 90 years old. She said, Rupert could not read and write. Because I didn't have the money to send him to school. I sent to school his other siblings, but I had no money to send him. And spoiler, used to write in something that we need to learn one of these days. X's and O's and this and some things going across like snakes and things. And that was his writing. And he understood it all. And he used to write on anything. Cigarette box, piece of bread, paper, anything. And remember everything. Every single line. A pure genius. And when he was singing, I want to fall. It is true because the alcohol that he had in was making him want to fall. Right? But didn't stop him from singing. You know, I, I, I've seen some amazing things by Calypso the, the, the music of the Caribbean. Not just Calypso. We have produced some of the finest jazz players in the world. Trust you me. We have a few in Barbados. Roberta Flax, bass player. It's a Barbadian. Her saxophone player was a Barbadian. Arthur Tapping. And there was once a time, a reporter asked her, what do you think of Kenny G? And Kenny G. And she said to, to him, Kenny G, listen to the whole statement, will one day get the chance to hold Arthur Tappin's saxophone case. Not the saxophone. That's how far a disparity in her head was the two. But yet, the millionaire was Kenny G. And the guy that just played was Arthur Tappin. Right? You see, this thing called music belongs to us. It's not about Calypso only. It's all of our music. I wrote a song once called Emerton. It's not a Calypso by the longest stretch of the imagination. But it became Till today was voted the greatest song. Can you hold it for me, Doc? For in, in the history of music in Barbados. Yeah, maybe I might, I might have to put in here. Forgive me a minute. Now, where, could you put this microphone back a little bit for me, please? Push it back, back, back. Yes, that's fine. That's fine. Just, is it holding up? Right. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me still from here? Yes. Yeah, okay. Right. No. This is how music affects the Caribbean. You tell me to forget that my grandmother was born right this oh, all right. I say I shall go You tell me to forget It is there I want my own children to grow All right, I say I shall go 
But I hope you understand how I feel about Emerton, my homeland, my homeland, my homeland. I hope you know it's true that I would never forgive you. Because look at, look at what you do to my Emerton. You tell me to forget that you bring bulldozers and push down the houses. So, all right, I say I shall go. You tell me to forget That you did them wrong things And didn't let my children know Well, all right, I say I shall go But I hope you understand How I feel about Emerton My homeland my homeland, my homeland. I hope you know it's true that I would never, never, never forgive you because of the car, the car, what you do to me, Hamilton. You tell me to forget that my grandmother was born right there, so well, all right, I say I shall go. All right, I say I shall go. All right, I say I shall go. Well, all right, I say. I shall go. Thank you. That's thank you. Thank you. We cannot mistake that for Calypso, but it's the song that. Nice. That thank you, Doc. That has resonated with Barbadian people for last few decades right now in Calypso I want to show you something I had a song that you're talking about humor written humor and this song is called horn I always let people know that I am horn proof I harm proof. I got so much horn that I harm proof now. Right? Here we go. I can sing it low, but you help me with it. All you got to sing is this, look. Face it. Face it. Face the reality, boy, you get in horn. Sing for me. Face What you say? Face Face the reality. Face the reality, boy, you get in. Well, all right. <laughs> Hear me. You walk in the morning. He walk in the evening. And so you hardly had time during the week for romance. You planning for Saturday or Sunday. You know he gonna make a play. You're ready to rendezvous, yes, to Dingole. Suddenly he making stupid excuse. He got to stay fit and trim. He can't indulge in no stupidness. He got to go to the gym. You're wearing Victoria's Secret. And he's still in taking you on. Face the reality, girl, you getting on. Let me hear the face it. Face 
face it, ah, uh -huh. face it. Face the reality, girl, you getting on. I want to hear you one more time. Face, ah, uh -huh. face, oh yes. Face the reality, girl, you get it. All right. <laughs> Big Sunday, you resting. The phone started ringing. And when you get up to answer, nobody there on the line. The phone ring again and he answer it. You know for sure it is her. Why? He make an excuse. He got to buy newspaper. But the newspaper take him the whole morning. He said he went for a walk. The facial expression say he lying. Look, he met the girl and they talk. You notice he start dying here. And in the mirror from dust till dawn. Face the reality, girl, you get in hard. And what you got to do it now? Sing it. Face. What you do? Face. Uh-huh. Face the reality, girl, you get in hard. Let me hear you one more time. Face. You got to just face it. Face the reality, girl, you get in hand. You know what I have a saying in the Caribbean? The women that say, we don't get vexed, we get even. <laughs> you notice she, busy, contented, and happy. There's nothing you ask the girl that she wouldn't do. She cooking, she washing, she cleaning house. Not a dirty dish in the sink. She even get on she knee and polish your shoe. But she always dress up when you get home. Something she never did before. And as you enter the residence, she heading hard for the door. And when you ask she girl, where you going? She said to visit she friend Yvonne. Face the reality, boy, you get in hard. So sing the thing. Face it. Uh -huh. Face it. I say, face the reality, boy, you get in hard. One more time we go in. Face it. Face it. Face the reality, boy, you get in hard. <laughs> It's amazing. The former Prime Minister of Barbados, he loved that song so much. He said, Gabby, he used to talk fast, you know, when after. Gabby, Gabby, sing, sing it, man, sing it. I get horn, you get horn, we horn people too. <laughs> so, you know, it's one of those songs they never really recorded, but see how we call and response, like I told you about Africa, call and response. And um, Calypso, and all genres of music have played very important roles in the development of our Caribbean society. And no one country can claim that they are the boss. Jamaica say we are the boss in reggae. Yes, but if you slow down, if you speed up reggae, you have calypso. You don't change, you know, nothing. You don't have to change the chords, nothing. Just speed it up and you have Calypso. But not only that, that strum that you're hearing in the, the, the reggae goes, a dip, a dip, a Trinidadian guy. So he gave them that. In the early days, in the ska, there was a guy called Jackie Opel from Barbados that went to Jamaica. And Bob Marley himself said that Jackie Opel was way ahead of his time. And not only that, we have recordings, believe it or not, it's very true, of Bob Marley and the Wailers singing background vocals for Jackie Opel. That's how highly respected he was in Jamaica. Died, unfortunately, in Barbados in a car accident at age 32. Right? Ladies and gentlemen, 
I could go on for quite some time. I had songs and songs and more songs, but these things affect the society in a very tangible manner that is uh, long lasting. And we must never give up on our Calypsos and our Calypsonians. And we must encourage young people in Barbados. I have a young son there. Bit, bit. Could you come down here a minute? Come here a minute. Yeah, there he goes. This youngster, he won the Calypso crown at age eight. Eight, yeah. But at age seven, he entered. They, they did not want him to enter when he was five. They, and I insisted that they have to change the law. And they said, okay, we will allow up to seven. But he went in and he's, he came across second um, that year. And he won the next year. They had COVID, COVID. Then he, he um, got to the finals again. And he's in the finals. Um, Sunday that just gone, he made the finals again. I want you to sing a song. I was born by the river in a little tent. Oh, and just like the river, I've been running ever since. All right, good. Thank you, dear. Thank you, All right, that. I was born by the river in a little tent, oh, and just like the river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long, oh, a long time coming, but I know, no, a change gonna come. Oh, yes, you will. And I go to the movies. And I go downtown. People keep telling me don't hang around. It's been a long, a long time coming but I know a change gonna come oh yes it will it's been too hard living but I'm afraid to die cause I don't know what's up there beyond the sky it's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. And I go to my brother. And I say, brother, help me, please. 
but he winds up knocking me oh back down on my knees there's been times that i thought i couldn't last for a long for a long for a long but now i think i'm able to carry on it's been a long a long time coming but i know change gonna come oh yes We were living happy and carefree, cussing the B and the DLP. The only thing that used to face we is if on time we don't receive we salary. Suddenly we hear about this pandemic. How it killing and making the people sick. We decided can't affect we get too far away. For we foolishness now we have to pay. So many people cried. So many people died. So many lost their mommy and daddy. Granny and granddaddy, uncle and sweet auntie, to the pandemic in this country. Yes, sorry, yes, sorry. We ask in the Lord above to cover us with love, to give us guidance, give us protection. The star we call injection is not the only solution. We must pray, pray. Pray for this island. Oh, yes, we must pray, pray, pray for this island. In we hurry, somehow it slip. We that Barbados is a tourism country. And that people would come here to visit. Yes, for the disease that bound to make we sick. Sars COVID 19 descended upon we in the month of March 2020. In no time at all, the island in big trouble. COVID cases fall up the hospital. So many people cried. So many people died. So many lost their mommy and daddy. Granny and granddaddy. Uncle and sweet auntie. To the pandemic in this country. Yes, sorry. Yes, sorry. We ask in the Lord above. To cover us with love, to give us guidance, give us protection. The star we call injection is not the only solution. We must pray, pray, pray for this island. Oh, 
Oh, yes, we must pray, pray, pray for this island. For this island. Thank you, bit bit. We got that up. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, this is where I get ready to make my exit, but I couldn't do it without thanking my friend Sam Raphael, thanking you, Dr. Joseph, Eclipse um, Association, especially Mr. Rob, Mr. Bob, where you is? Oh, oh, you're fixing up the engineering and thing. Yes. And um, I wanted to say something else. Um, Someone had mentioned Louis Farrakhan earlier. We are very, very close friends. I had a grandson that was killed in New York a few months ago, and Minister Farrakhan called me and we talked for about an hour. But I've known him for a lot of years, and yes, he was a very good calypso singer. He used to sing under the name The Charmer. And um, you will be surprised to learn that Maya Angelou was also a very good calypso singer before she went to poetry. Very good, she used to call herself Miss Calypso, right? So, you know, this Calypso is nothing new. Nat Cole sang it, Bing Cosby sang it. As you know, Belafonte, yeah, he was the man known for it, and so on. And we must always, always bear in mind that Calypso belongs to the Caribbean, belongs to us, and that we must embrace it with everything we have. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. Gabby, I'm going to give you a chance to get a drink of water if you need one, um, because we're going to have the open discussion and I trust that uh, Bob will be able to help me with that. So Bob has the roving microphone. And so what we will do is for a few minutes, mindful of time, we will allow for members of the audience to engage by asking questions if you have them. I see already that we have one person who has raised his hand. And so, Gabby, I invite you to come back to the podium, and Bob will rove with the microphone, okay? Thank you, Dr. Joseph. Okay. Yes, good night, sir. Very good um, insights here on your Calypso, the history and everything. Um, so, we are told, oh, sorry, he's not ready, is he? Yeah, we are told that Calypso is about social commentary. And of course, as we speak about the role of Calypso in the Caribbean and so on, I want you to speak a little bit about the whole question of, let's say, um, libel and slander. I mean, in the old days, you would sing Calypso and nobody would worry about those things. But in contemporary times, modern times, Calypsonians or people who sing have to sort of look at those kind of lyrics, lyrical contents, I want you to speak a little bit about, um, you know, libel and standards. It relates to the whole Calypso business. Yes. Libel and scandal is very real in any kind of art form. Um, even in journalism, journalists will find that there are certain things that they would love to say, but the libel and, and in the Caribbean, most of the libel and scandal laws are almost identical because they were handed down to us from the British. And you have to be very careful. Now, I wrote a song called Jack. I almost got sued for one single line. 
I was going along well, and then I said, Tell Big Cats Jack, I say, that the beach belong to me. I got a call. Um, Gabby, um, it's all right to be talking about Mr. Jack there like this, but um, you're insulting him now. You're saying he's a big guts man. Uh, would you please um, withdraw those lines or we may have to seek legal advice. And that was the radio station. Voice of Barbados. So, they asked me if they could edit out the big guts and just say, tell Jack, I say. I said, no problem. Well, they edited it. But CBC, Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation, did not realize that it was edited. Because the whole song going, and nobody studying the word big guts or the words big guts. So CBC played the whole big guts thing. I get a call again. Gabby, we ask you to edit out big guts, and you're insisting that it must stay. This is the last warning. So I had to make the call now to CBC to tell them, look, big guts can't play. Just play as tell Jack I say. Because I used to sing, tell big guts Jack I say that the beach belong to me. So I had to sing, tell Jack that I say that the beach belong to me. And that is the difference between libel and scandal and carte blanche to keep on going so yes it's very important thanks for the question yes mine is just an observation when your son yes was singing yes on the ballads his demeanor was so different but calypso has such a life of its own when he sat in the Calypso, you could see he want, didn't want to be constrained anymore. Pulled his mic and took on a real different persona as a, as a relator. So that impressed me and that is what comes out in Calypso. You actually, although you're singing, you're talking to your audience. And, you know, he really had us, um, had me, you know, attentive. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. Yes, Gabby, a wonderful presentation, I must say. I've been to many of them, and this is about the best. Thank you. Your presentation. Thank you, sir. Um, what I want to ask, you mentioned something very early about Calypsos can actually make a government, break a government. Yes. And interestingly, some years ago, a Calypso in Dominica did sing that. I think there was a scrunter who said Calypso can make and break governments. The question is that um, presently today, that it's an enigma in that Calypsos don't make and break governments. It almost seems that Calypsos embolden governments, which is a very funny statement to make, because in our Dominican situation, I see it happen across the region also. When a Calypsonian would sing, let's say two decades ago, three decades ago, on a, on a particular issue, you find there's a whole plethora of songs against the government or conditions that happen in the country. Mm -hmm. You are sure as a historian that that government is going to fall. Mm -hmm. Today, we have a nine times king who almost every time sings against the government and the government gets more votes. <laughs> so I am just saying that, so I just want you to address that situation yeah. as I see. So Calypso, so Calypso basically has become a staged event mm -hmm. more than a consciousness of the people. So I just wanted to comment on that. Well, I think that's a good opinion, but I don't agree. And I'll tell you why I don't agree. Calypso that is political depends on airplay more than anything else. On what governments do that are in power that nowadays is if that calypso is against them, it gets limited airplay. It may come and live in the tent and the people get on and so on, but you see on the air, 
Okay. Well, it acts, uh, I'm glad to hear that that is not the case in Dominica, but I can assure you that in Trinidad and Tobago and in other islands, including Barbados, that that, especially on a government-owned station, on the other station, no problem. In St. Vincent, for example, the government-owned stations will play only pro-government Calypso's. Ralph is my friend. Ralph knows that is true. On the other station, there is nothing that Ralph could get on that station. As a matter of fact, I'll give you a story. One morning, most people know that Ralph is my dear, dear friend. So, one morning, in the middle of the campaign, Ralph told me, Gabby, let me go get Lil Fan Man. I say, what? That radio station, they, they completely against me, you know. So let's go in and ask for an interview. Now, Ralph know, knows that the possibility of that occurring would be like if Jesus come back and turn water into wine. So we gone up. This is about 6 o'clock in the morning. And Ralph gone up very quiet. Good morning, and how are you? And the, Ralph Gonzalez. Don't come in here. What you doing in here? Go over the other side. Go, go, do, 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 go. Well, I'm to come to get an interview. It's, uh, you know, it's a radio station. An uh, interview with here? No, 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 no. Go over there. Look over there for you. Over here for us. Outside. Ralph said, but I'm going to be the prime minister tomorrow. You would never be the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Never. So Ralph said, okay, madam. And Ralph left. Meanwhile, they're playing these calypses against Ralph and this and that and it's right. The next morning, Ralph, his wife, a friend of mine, his bodyguard, and myself, gone to government house about quarter six in the morning the swearing Ralph as the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So when it was all over now, here up, Gabby boy, let me go and get a little sport. I said, <laughs> you carried me for sport yesterday. I almost got killed in a real estate. So what sport are you talking about? He said, we're going back to the same young lady there. So Ralph come back to the race. He said, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Prime Minister. I'm here to... And, and, and she start packing up the things them that she got. Ralph said, where are you going? She said, well, I know you're going to fire me because you know that I am against your party and especially against you. And this is, Ralph said, girl, don't be stupid. Just put back the things that they, because you're against me, I'm supposed to fire you. She said, huh? Just keep your job. This is all right. She became the only member of her family we knew that voted for Ralph. Not only voted, campaigned after that. Right? So sometimes Acalypso can be very, very powerful in determining governments. And at that time, they had about 20 against Ralph and 3 million for Ralph. And depending, so a one Calypso might not do it. But if you have a plethora of Calypsos that constantly kicking, hitting day and night, believe you me, my brother, it can have tremendous effect. But what people do these days, they look at the Calypso and hey, he always singing against my party, you know, he always against my party. Don't mind, don't take him on, he always against my party. Right? Regardless of what that party is. But believe you me, when I sang Boots, Tom Adams immediately banned it on the air and said that I was against the military of Barbados and how this and that and the third and so forth. Why Tom banning it? Tom's wife called me. Gabby, we love that song. <laughs> Tom is being here dancing to it all the time. Tom loved it, but he said it, but it's against he and his party. He's not going to let it stand on the air. But we love it. I want you to know that we love it. You see, so it has that kind of effect. When Gypsy sang, Captain, the ship is sinking. It made a big difference in that Trinidad election that year. A big, big, big difference. 
and Sparrow sang the year before that. I'm going to bring back Solomon, who don't like a complaint to the commission. I am no dictator, but when I pass an order, Mr. Speaker, this matter must go no further. I have nothing more to say, and it must be done my way. Come on, come on, meeting done for the day. My word is law. So watch your face. If you slip, you slide. This is my place. And I say that Solomon will be minister of external affair. And if you don't like it, get to hell out of here. <laughs> right? In pack. And then he sang another one about Solomon that was the opposite to what he said before. In pack again. Right? You have Calypsoans in this country that are very good. Unfortunately, they're not known as they should be known in other Caribbean territories. That's the problem. That's the problem, you know. Not their quality, not their ability. I heard them myself. The first time I came, I was with Valde Henry. And I listened to this. I said, but Valde, this guy's good. She said, Gabby, you hear nothing yet, but wait till the finals, boy. The finals night. I was amazed at the high standard. Sometimes, it's not the Calypso, I'm not knocking anybody, but sometimes it's the coordination between the Calypsonian and the band that makes the difference. The coordination. Sometimes you go and rehearse, rehearse, and when you go up there, you can't believe where the band playing at all. It's totally different to what you rehearse, right? And I'll tell you something else. They have some bands that like certain Calypsonians across the Caribbean. And they're going to play better for them than they play for you, whoever you are. That is not a joke. And they have no shame or regret or nothing like that. They, they do it. Because they, man, must have that advantage. And then worse than that, we have certain judges that do certain things that make sure that they do their duty, quote-unquote. But when you examine it, I remember a year, a judge, I, I sang a song called Henry Fraser. Henry Fraser is a big man in Barbados. And he said, big man. First of all, he was head of the um, medical uh, thing at UWE. Then he was a, an historian. And he was a lecturer, first class. And I sang a song that went. I feel so sorry for Henry. Fraser, the professor. He called me dancing belly culture. Even though he's not a Euro vulture. I already tell he Africa lies in me. That is why I just dance and expose my body. But if Henry want to dance like a Bajan, I will teach the professor how to jam. Henry, come, let me show you how to whine. Just station uh, for the demonstration. White boy, watch the action. Forget your pigmentation. And whine, professor, whine. Whine, professor, whine. Do like Gabby and expose your body. Wine professor, wine professor, wine Henry Fraser, wine. As far as they're concerned, Henry Fraser, nice, decent, quiet, easy man. What Gabby talking about wine? With this decent professor of medicine at, at the University of West Indies. When the scores came in, they left me out. Totally out. And as a matter of fact, they told me that my song was bordering on libel and scandal. There was nothing. My lawyers had passed the song, the NCF had passed, because I don't know about here, but we have to submit our lyrics to the National Cultural Foundation before we sing it. So they can vet it, so they could say, okay, yes. And it, and it got the yes, but it got the no from the judges. 
Three days later, Henry Fraser calls me. Gabby, I love that song. I love that song. Right? But I already out the people competition. This is not a joke. You see, some judges do not know how to judge Calypso. Believe you me. I just wait for them and let her do the thing and then I ask them, do you know about rhyme, on rhyme line, melodic flow, freshness, attack, bass pattern, horn lines, riffs, chord structure, phrasing, timing, microphone technique. Do you know these things? Um, but Gabby, that's not on the um, sheet. I said they're called subcategories. And if you don't know the subcategories, you cannot judge. You should not be allowed to judge. You are judging, oh, lyric, melody, presentation, rendition. That's all right, but each one of them have a subcategory that you cannot put on. Because the people will be from here to Afghanistan. It don't make no sense. But you, if you're a judge, a really good judge, you have to know those things. Thank you. Okay, we have more questions. Um, Dr. Damien Dublin. I was asked to... Um, introduce people when I do know their names. Go ahead. TV will catch us. Good evening. Um, let me thank the Calypso Association for making the perfect choice, I think, in bringing you here. Your lecture was on the ball. I just want you to give some opinion as to the importance of collaboration and linking with other Calypsonians because you mentioned the friendship you had with Spyro and Kitchener and also the importance of archive in Calypso, because I listened to the young lady's speech and the difficulty she had in just getting information. Uh, I think it's very important that, sorry, we need to archive. So give us some, some a little um, focus well, on that. you know, it's a new world. We have social media. The Calypso associations of the Caribbean should connect to each other through social media. It's simple. And we have Derek Hunter Centros. Yes, good night, Gabby, my good friend. Good How are you doing, night, brother? How are you keeping? Good to see you, <laughs> good, man. Good, good. I, I remember, I remember um, our tour in London. Actually, he was my roommate. It was Barbados Independence, and they took me from Dominica straight to London. Yep. Boo. Miss Boo, he died. The, yeah, the Boo husbands. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, good. My question is. Um, over the years, we've seen Calypso crowds dwindling around the Caribbean. What do you think is the problem for this, and uh, what can we do to get the crowds back? Very good question there. Thank you. What we have done is to tell the young people that Soka and Calypso are not married to each other anymore. So the young people want to hear about six things. Jerk, joke, wine, hands in the air, rum, and what we can do is she. Them is, them is the six things that you, that once you got them, you have the Calypso or the Soka, right? So we have the beat without the songs. If we can create the beat and the songs together, that marriage is important. It can bring young people back. In Barbados, we have a big following for young people, like bit bit and them. And nowadays, what the NCF did was to make the shows free. Make this, even the semi-final was free. And uh, the, the, but they gave away the tickets, so you have to go to the NCF to get the tickets. Once you get the tickets, you come. Young people, old people, uh, uh, grandmothers, grandfathers, you know, little babies, they all attend the, the, the Junior Monarch uh, co competition. And the, and the Calypso competition still draws a good sized crowd. Not in comparison to the parties. The parties can draw 10, 15, 20,000 people. The, 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 the so, so called Monarch, however you call that. But the Calypso finals, Last year, they had uh, over 6,000 people at the finals. Not as big as when Bag and I used to compete, where we have 10, 15, 20,000 people. But the point is, once you, you see, 
Music is brainwashing. And if you play, what happens on the radio stations in the Caribbean today is that they don't play the social commentary, they play the party songs. And if you keep hearing party, 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 you cannot graduate towards the social commentary. So we need to rectify that by playing the social commentaries. And a lot of these young DJs too, if you don't have a recording from a studio, they won't see it at all. They want only the recording. They can press the button and get back to go inside that computer and look for a song called Bananas Are Great by the mighty, you know, River, 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 River Sand or whatever your name. He, he, they, they ain't got no time with that. He has to have a CD or a thing on a stick or whatever they call it and then they press that button and they're gone, right? It's laziness. But it does not mean that we shouldn't try to keep the art form going because it is in our belly. It has survived jazz, blues, rock, reggae, uh, you name it. Every time they say Calypso dead, Calypso do so rise again like a phoenix, right? So we have to encourage the young people to come up to the tents and so on and see, right? And get involved. It's not foreign to them. It is something that they could and would em em embrace if it is advertised. Look, for example, I remember in Barbados two years ago, not two years ago, four years ago, before the pandemic, we advertising the Calypso Finals. And for every ad we get, the people get the, the soccer thing, get 20. How are you going to compete with that? 20, I mean 20, every one, one of our split, 20 of theirs, 200 of us. So it ended up that we ended up with 4,000 people and they end up with 20. People. So many people like this better, they hear about it more. That's all, they hear about it more. And I would advise some of the, the uh, business people that how Mr. Raphael has done, to get involved with the art form. Don't look at it as some kind of foreign entity. It belongs to Dominica. Get involved with it. I was telling Mr. Raphael that Byron Lee was smart, very smart. When we used to work with Byron Lee in Jamaica, what Byron would do, he would have something called Jamaica Carnival. Now everybody say, Jamaica is the land of reggae and that Calypso can't be up there tall with nothing. Well, I want you to know that I had something called Reggae Sunsplash. And they draw 40,000 people. I hear by you, yeah, be man. If you can only get like a little, a little 20,000, we'll be, be happy, man. It's all right, man. It's a reggae a long time ago. Yeah, Jamaica, that reggae country, man. But me, I try. We went down halfway tree. And the police had helicopters monitoring everything. And when they finished with the figures, Reggae Sun Splash draw 40,000 and we draw 60,000 in Jamaica, that is the land of reggae. And Byron Lee said, Look at me, Byron Lee start crying with joy. They say the Jamaica don't like Calypso. They're going to be mad, man. They're going to be people there, man. Right? And he was, like I told you, he was smart. Byron went to the government and did not ask for no money at all. He said, all I want is your blessings for me to have this carnival in Kingston. He goes to DNG, it would be the equivalent of a Carib or whatever bear they got here. Tell them, he want product. He want no money. They give him product. Oh, and the right to put his ad either next to theirs or cover theirs for the season, for the time. Did the same thing to the, the other drink people, the ice cream people. He told them he want free ice cream for the children for a specific day held at the police recreational facility in Kingston. That you, you come with your child, and the guaranteed thing is free ice cream. Or who ain't carrying child to get free ice cream? <laughs> free ice cream from the place. So by running playing for that, the ice cream people paying for that. But they got it in a cup with all the advertising things and so on, on the cup, right? He goes 
to the airlines. I don't want no money. I would like you to bring up Gabby and Sparrow and this body and the next body from Trinidad and you wire bend the fella. You want you bring him too so he could make the costumes right here in Jamaica. So said, so done. Go to the Pegasus. I don't want no money. I don't want nothing from you other than put up Gabby and them for me at this hotel for free. Story that goes to the radio stations. I ain't want no odd thing for you. I want you to talk about this morning, noon, and night on the radio station. And that's how he operated. And then he offered only season tickets, no individual tickets. If it's eight events, you buy your ticket for all eight events one time. Now, you ain't going to know eight events, you're going to two or three. <laughs> Right, Sam? We're going to two or three. But Byron got your money for eight. Right? But he gave us a nice price. Yet he said, well, yeah, let me go. But, they, but he guaranteed that he good. So if you stay home, that is your business. And then the ticket thing with the drinks on it, you got to buy X amount one time. You might not drink all of them drinks. But Byron got your money for all the drinks that you did not drink. Right? And that's how it became such a successful thing. But unfortunately, he died, and I haven't heard anything about it since then. But what I'm saying, in Dominica, you can do the same thing. Scholars Association, have your effects and your this and that. Don't, don't disintegrate yourself, or don't separate yourself from the young people, effects and things. Let everything be one, one season ticket for the, for the carnival. And this way, you're going to embrace the young people and they embrace you. And you're going to get a lot of success out of that. Okay, I'm mindful of the time, so I'm going to take three more people. Cecil wanted to go. Um, young lady over here, you wanted to go as well. And I believe there was somebody on that side. Okay, so I will start with Mr. Cecil Joseph from DBS. Thank you. Um, Gabby, first of yes. all, let me just say thank you. As I was to stand, sorry. Just first of all, let me say thank you for gracing us. Um, with your knowledge, I'm very much appreciative of the fact that you are able to be here to grace us with such information that some of us may not have known. Um, I'm the guy who is on your chat from Dominica, is always fighting with you all about Dominica and our cricket. So whenever we talk about cricket on the chat, I'm yeah. the one. <laughs> What's your name? Cecil Joseph. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I love your comments. Uh, thanks. Yes. Yeah. You and the, there's another guy, I don't know if he's from here. Ben, Benu. Yeah. Yes. We, we try to push the Dominica cricket into yes. the beach. Uh, um, Athanas was the guy. Athanas. Athanas. I like he real, real, real <laughs> bad. He should have been up there. I think we would have beat Scotland and them. But that's another story for another time. But. <laughs> Right. I, I just want to find out from you, um, and before, I just want to thank the Calypso Association for that type of discussion, and I wish that the Calypso Association can do that maybe quarterly instead of maybe doing it once a year. Um, I think that's important for the love of the art. Um, I want to find out from you, sir, that I realize in Dominica, every decade, we have a different tune in reference to Calypso, not lyrics, but tune, the melody. So what was in the 70s is not what you hear in terms of melody in the 80s, and that's what you heard in the 90s, and now in the 20s, we're hearing something different. In terms of the evolution of Calypso, um, I, I first want to bless um, Hunter. I remember when he brought in Carib Bacchanal with mm -hmm. Bouillon, that the Dominican public didn't grace it or did not accept it, today it is the in thing. I want to find out from you what is your view about vintage Calypso and the evolution of, of, of Calypso? Okay, very good question. First of all, let me tell you something. Hunter is not ordinary Calypsonian. I don't know if he still competes or not. I haven't seen my buddy for a long time. But he has a very high standard of Calypso and his style. What we like to call classical or vintage Calypso. Some people call it old style, right? 
All that really happened is that beat, you know. Not the lyrical content and the melodies, it's the beat. They change the beat, right? And they call it soca. But we used to call it ring bang. Why? Because that's what Eddie Grant first brought. We brought it out first with Dr. Cassandra, Papa Chunks, and a ring, a ring, a ring bang. Those are the first three songs in that genre that came. Now, for me, who did both? If you hear, you hear it in the Cassandra, and then you hear the difference in the boots or Jack or Hit It or something like that. A good song is a good song, regardless to what we call genre or style or pattern. It needs to be recorded at the best. Do not sacrifice time. Nowadays, these young people work out that we can get the song that real popular this year. So when it's done, the people will be asking them, boy, it was real good this year. I hope you come good next year, you know, because it is no good after four months. But for them, it is real good, but for four months. And they don't care if it dies and never be played again next year. With us, we wanted to make music that lasts for decades, right? So we spent time in the studio. I remember when I first recorded Eddie Grant. Man, I used to be so tired because sometimes Eddie made me sing one line 40 and 50 times. One line. I said, but Eddie, it song very good to me. It song good to you, but not to me. I'm the engineer here, you know. Go back in there and sing that line. And I sang. Once I sing it now, he's flying it right through the other parts of the song now, right? Take your time and record. You always just say, we're not recording for our people today. We're recording that when the grandchildren come, they could say, boy, them old people did a great job here with this music. Right? That's the problem. Our recordings today is what they call fast food restaurant recordings. You get inside quick and get out as quickly as possible. I once was doing a recording with a good, well, my cousin, who's a very good singer. And um, I was in the studio with this guy, so I said, the mic, you go over again, this line, this and that, you're pitchy, a little, bit, a little too pitchy there, you know, you, you, you're right, you're hitting the key, right, the emotion isn't there, you're this and that and that. If I press the button, hey, Gabby, uh, listen, uh, no disrespect, right, but um, you see what you're doing there? Young people didn't want that, man, they want frenzy. I said, Frenzy, so you can't get quality and frenzy together? Yeah, but boy, you got another set of people coming in here next two hours, right? And you go get this here done here now. So, Mike, go ahead and do your thing, boy. Your you song ain't good. Song real bad. But for him, it is about time and getting out of the studio. With me and the recorders at Eddie Grant, we did not know what was time. We could be in there at 8 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock the next morning a little bit of water and some little snack or something but the commitment is to make first class music that you will be proud of in years to come and throughout the islands i realized that the fast food restaurant thing is working and another thing eddie grant used to say he said if you want a toyota you could go down to the toyota dealers Talk to them, bring the money, and in two to three days' time, insurance and everything, you driving on the roads of Dominica and Barbados and Trinidad, a Toyota. But if you want a Rolls Royce, you will write or call the Rolls Royce people and ask them if they will be so kind as to put you on the list for the people that will have a Rolls Royce that year. I said that's the difference between making great music and making good music. And that's all that's lacking between the two genres to make great music. Look at jazz. People were singing jazz in 1910, 20, 30, 40, and 50, and 60, you know. If you go in the United States today, in any of those colleges, they're playing jazz. They're singing it and recording it. 
They don't know what is the new genre where that is concerned. But they're still making the pop songs that like my friend Rihanna does do. But they respect and honor the jazz because it is a root music. It is something that springs from them. And by the way, I want to tell you something that's very true. An old man, I can't remember his name, he was 94 years old. He said, before I leave this earth, I want to make it abundantly clear, this is live on television in the United States, that every single beat we play in jazz, in particular from New Orleans, came from the Caribbean. I shocked. I said, what nonsense he talk? I told jazz for he said it came from three Caribbean countries, Haiti, Martinique, and Guadeloupe. He said it came from those three in the French quarters in New Orleans. He said, and I dare anybody to dispute me. But I want you to know that they went to a commercial and did not bring him back. A very good question, my brother. Yes. Uh, anyway. uh, Gabby, I have just two more because it's, yeah. I'm watching the time. Um, I'll take Leoma Joseph. Okay. Good evening to you. Good evening, ma'am. And um, I must tell you, I almost lose my thoughts because of your interesting information this evening. I am not a Calypsonian, but I am a follower of Calypso. A fan, okay. yes. You're a fan, yes. Sorry, you're a fan. My background is from Calypso. My nine-time king is my fifth cousin. And so I have, you know, that Calypso feeling in me. Yeah. I must say that I have a daughter who is the same age. Well, a bit, bit. Yes. Yeah. And then I must say that I missed a lot of information because I, I, she, she did the same SBA with Ms. Ms. Grant, Grant Intergrant. And I say, had I had this information this evening, I would have flavored that SBA for her. But um, let me just ask you about the Calypso um, competition. And I just want to get your feeling, or whether in your time, whether you had any a cappella during Calypso. And what, do you, what are your views on a cappella of the Calypsonians during the competition, especially during the finals? What weight does it carry, or what do you think about singing a cappella during a competition? Well, I don't know if it's a cappella. You make like making up stuff on the on the on the on the on the stage. Are you singing a cappella without any music? We don't do that in Barbados. Um, we don't do it in Trinidad. I don't know any other uh, island, but that's a good. That's a very good um, idea. What they do, which I don't always agree with, is that let's say they had four singers that were really really good, and this fella is coming up. He is going to sing some derogatory thing about the person or the song that they're doing or something to try to get the audience on his side or on her side. Right? So you would find that let's say a song is very popular and a fellow might be singing about how, you know, mangoes are very important and so on. And somebody will come and say, don't mind he about mangoes. He might have can't afford to buy rice. Right? Or something like that. So you will get that kind of exchange occurring. But we don't do um, the a cappella thing. But I would like that because, because of the fact that I do extempo, I would, I would be happy to do something like that. All right. So I have one more question. question and sir. that is from Gregory Rabes. Gregory? Ayahora. Thank you. Gabby, great stuff. Thank I'm you. I'm close to Rosie Douglas, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Going back in time, the Cuban connection. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask a question quickly or your thoughts on the question of um, Calypso and the decolonization of our education system. We, we um, talk about the junior monarchs in the very, um, islands and so on. Chuck does himself wrote an article on Calypso and education and so on. And we have the whole business of, 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 of Calypso as literature, uh, the poetic devices and all of that. Um, what are your thoughts on that? On how we can engage the, the, the formal education system in that sort of people's processes of decolonization? Thank you. 
Very good question. Thank you for the question. First thing about our music and how we can reach our people, I call it um, getting to the, to the story quickly. And the greatest person I've ever come across in the Calypso field to do that was Shadow. Not me, not Sparrow, not Chalky, not Juke, not Beckett, not Hunter, not Scranter, Shadow. See, Shadow had a style which we call economy of words. I want you all to say the word no after I say this. You working? You're joking. You're dealing? So you're stealing? You're looking for harm. You, you, you see how he, how he he took a whole story that could have had a million words and he said to you, asking questions, you're working? You working? No. You joking? No. You dealing? No. So you're stealing? You looking for horn? <laughs> right? And then he described why you're looking for horn. He said, Friday evening, people passing with their bo box of chicken. She, she, she watching you with your old shoe. She feeling to beat you. You understand? And then he says a song like I was planning to give up Calypso to go and plant peas in Tobago but I am afraid I can't make the grade. Because every night I lay down in my bed I hear in a basement in my head. There are no more words. Boom, boom, ba, dum, boom. Boom, 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 ba, dum, boom. Boom, 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 ba, dum, boom. Boom, 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 boom. He didn't want no words. He tells the story in what we call economy of words. And he was the greatest exponent of that that we had. He made one word work for ten. That's how you can get to the children easily. Use Shadow's example. Now, Arrow. Arrow had a song called Heart, Heart. A feeling, hot, hot, hot. People in the party, hot, hot, hot. They come with the party with what they got. You hot, he hot, she hot. Is the biggest calypso ever, because it's simple, it's easy, and it making sense. You know, it comes off in pop music too. Mick Jagger sang a song called Satisfaction. I can't get no. Satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. Gonna try, gonna try, gonna try, gonna try. I can't get no, 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 eh, eh, eh. Millions of records sold. James Brown, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. A million times. It, it's not about overloading. I call it overloading. We are journalists. I just call it them calypses with them big set of words, letters to the editor. You don't need it. What you need is words that have impact immediately. Is it necessary to have so much soldiers in this small country? No, 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 no. Well, don't tell me, tell Tommy. He put them in St. Lucie. Unemployment high and the treasury low and he buying books to cover soldier tour. I see them books. Boots, boots are more boots. On the feet of young trigger happy recruits. I see them boots, boots, boots are more boots. Marching, threatening army troops. Tell Tom I say that wouldn't do. He got to see about me and you, and most of all, our little children, and stop them soldiers from marching. How? Left, right, left, right in the government boots, the government boots. No big set of words, but powerful and impactful. Thanks for the question, brother.
Thank you all for the questions. And thank you to Dr. Anthony Mighty Gabby Carter. Thank you, everyone. Um, you can have your seats. I, just one more part. Um, I would like to ask. I would like to ask Mr. Daryl Bob, the Bob, who is the secretary of the Dominica Calypso Association, to give the vote of thanks. Mr. Daryl Bob. Dr. Joseph, I want to say one thing. I am very proud of the Dominica Association. It's the only one we have in the whole Caribbean that have their own place. They have its own place. None the rest of us do. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to say thanks to the Almighty Father, first of all, for making us, for making tonight the success that it is. Um, it's just a wonderful idea that we started with a day of prayer in Grand Bay. And I think our efforts moving forward are going to be blessed. Right, Observer? So thank you so much, folks, for giving us the support. All we're trying to do is to make people understand what Calypso really means to us as a black people. You know? Um, nothing more than that, basically. Just, it's not just about the music and the, and the tilling to it, but really what it means to us, our development as a black people, our emancipation, and you name it. So I just want to say thanks for coming out, you all coming out here tonight. Let me say thanks to our sponsors, our partners, and we hope, the Calypso Association hopes that we will continue, this relationship will continue into the future because education obviously is a continuous thing, or is it supposed to be? Um, as long as a man lives, a human being lives, he learns. And it's said that we, are, we live to learn. So thank you so much to the University of the West Indies Open Campus. Thank you so much for your energy, Dr. Kimon Joseph. From the first day we spoke, this thing just took off. And if we can do such great work in such short time, I think if we stick together, we can do a number of things that are way beyond just what we see. So hats off to the UE and Kimon and the staff. We want to say thanks to Jungle Bay Dominica. I kind of have a little confusion whether it's Jungle Bay Resort or Jungle Bay Dominica. Uh, <laughs> but we, we are honored to work with you. Um, this, this whole thing was so, it was meant to be. From the, the, within like three or so minutes of speaking with the people at our partners, they agreed and it was like, you know, so thank you so much, Sam. And it's so special seeing you here with us tonight. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for taking Mighty Gabby to Rosa tonight, and um, we really hope that you know this relationship can continue into the future. Wow! Wow! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Sam. I would like to say special thanks to DBS Radio. We have a very strong relationship with DBS Radio that I, I will admit um, an observer will support me on that, that we don't take full advantage of. And, and Cecil gives us a lot of flack for that. We at the Dominica Calypso Association have, we have made a decision to, to fix that and, and, and expect us to come to you with more programs, Cecil. And um, we know your energy is high, as high as ours, and we, we're very thankful for everything you've done. Thank you. I want to thank the... The only radio station to have had Calypso Day every hour, every minute of the day. That's what Cecil wants me to say. And, and I'll say it again if you want me to, because Cecil has given a lot of value. Thank you, Cecil. It's true. So, um... Yes, I just want to, you know, thank guys like Washla, Gregory Rabias for being here tonight, you know, the, the great Ra of Bouillon. Um, tomorrow we will be um, having the youth discussion 
um, where Bouillon is going to be part of it because we, we're having a, a sort of tie up with the lyrics of Bouillon and we're sort of using Calypso to compare it and see where we can move forward. Um, I want to say thanks to Miss Jacinta, please stand, Jacinta Grant. <laughs> Jacinta really stole the show. And um, Jacinta is the youngest person in the room here right now. We really wanted to bring out young people. Well, well, yes, 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 you're 12 years old. <laughs> yeah, all right. So, but thank you so much, Jacinta. Thank you for your energy. You have really impressed us. And um, we look forward to the continuity of the connection that we have. Uh, let me say special thanks to Mr. Ian Jackson for, for, um, for your, the article that you released on the Calypso Day. You're the only writer so far I've seen release something in the newspaper. And we want to thank you so much, Jackson. I want to thank, I want to thank a, a real, you know, a superior picky. I mean, this, this, is, this is one of our elders in the house. Thank you. I also want to thank Ms. Frederick O'Reilly for being here. Frederick is the president of Shodong Mass Camp. And of course, um, Stardom is represented here because most of the association are Stardom members. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Black Diamond and your, your beautiful sister. Thank you, Father Thomas, for your prayers and for helping us bless our lecturer tonight. Thank you, Joey, for being the workers. The guys from the radio, Daryl Teet, and I see Miss Evelina Baptist, one of our senior judges. Thank you for coming. But our executive members, Hunter and your beautiful wife here tonight, Sai, Bassi, he's hiding somewhere. Yeah, Narin, Lady S, and our president, Observer. And I must include Ras Kelly. Ras Kelly, your spirit is with us. You're alive. You're not a ghost, and, <laughs> and Rascally, it really, I mean, thank you so much for opening the doors for us. Um, I, I felt really honored when um, Dr. Carter mentioned that we are the only association with a house, so I want to say thanks to you, the pioneer of that, and, and Jackson again, and Ian Jackson. So we have so much to be proud of. Thank you for being here, Fael. We have so much to be proud of, and we look forward to, we look forward to, I want to shout out to um, Tasha P, the only Dominican Calypso queen. Thank you for being here, Tha Tasha, and thank you. Thank you, Fredos, for taking Mighty Gabby around. Thank you, picking him up at the airport and giving him a good time today. And I'm sure Lord Caressa, Lord Caressa also, <laughs> Stand up, sir. He is now politician slash Calypsonian. Thank you so much. But the folks at the State College, they're supporting us strongly on what's going to be happening tomorrow, the youth discussion. And we want to reach out to, seeing that we're live on radio, I'll say thank you so much to Ashman McDougall and um, Trudy Christian for your efforts and getting this to happen tomorrow afternoon, live on DBS Radio Tune In for the discussion on Calypso. It's youth stuff. Yeah, at 2.30 tomorrow. <clears throat> and the, the National Youth Council is also part of that as well. So guys, all in all, let me just say thank you, thank you, and thank you. <clears throat> and then tomorrow night, there's more to be thankful for. We're having a social slash spectacle at the Alliance Francaise. Yeah? Mighty Gabby and his son will be performing live. We, we, time, 8 o'clock. Um, doors open at 8, and we will be, all Calypsonians who, will, who are present will have the opportunity to perform for you live. We, tomorrow is the climax. It's Calypso Day tomorrow, guys. So see you at the Alliance Princess tomorrow evening. We'll be accepting a small contribution at the door. It's so small, the treasurer told me don't even mention it. So, but, yes. Oh, Cecil just said it will be carried live on Facebook. Thanks again. Thank so thank you. Mighty Gabby? I think yes. Yes, yes, yes. I think, um, yeah, right. So Mighty Gabby, save the best for last, you know. <clears throat>
because I actually composed, I composed a little, a little calypso, right? If we can't say thank you, what else can we do? If we can't say we love you, brother, what else can we do? But mighty Gabby, we expect to see you again. So make this country your home away from home. Mighty Gabby, come, come, come. Bring your friends with you, Dominica's the place to be. Tell them, Sam, it is the place to be. Thank you, thank you. Bob, I thank you, as you could see. We gathered here, now at you we. Look the hunter then from to me, my partner from now till eternity. And you all know I don't give a damn. I am a big friend of that man, Sam. And anytime I hear you could guarantee, me Gabby will be staying by. <laughs> And so it is the job of the person who um, cheers to thank the person who gave the vote of thanks. So thank you very much to Bob. And just to let everybody know on your way out, we have some snacks. If you can just socialize for a few minutes before you head out, we'd be grateful. Thank you so much for coming, everyone, and take care. Uh, Bob, is that your kerchief? <laughs> Bob,